Okay, Genesis chapter 3. Now, it is a strange chapter to go through um, um, on a um, week or a few days before Christmas because it is the chapter that changes everything. This is the chapter that, that man fall. Adam and Eve sinned against God in disobedience, and it just changed the whole world. This is the chapter that I think every one of us should study over and over, and at least read several, at least once a month, read this chapter and be reminded of where it all started and how it's still continuing on today, because we do have choices like Adam and Eve had choices back then. And so I'm hoping to uh, give you as much information here, but it's up to you to to really um, look at the chapter and, and draw some great wisdom from it. Now, a true Christian desires to be free from sin and not to sin freely. Let me say that again. A true Christian, a believer in Christ Jesus, who knows him personally, desires to be free from sin and not to sin freely. He never wants to sin freely. And we look at our world and we see what's going on and not just our church, but other churches, and we see people sinning freely. Uh, he's going to list uh, some things here that, that um, are very much sin, and we can probably list some things uh, from the New Testament and find out what sin is. Uh, go to Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh. Corinthians, Romans, list some uh, works of the flesh there also. These are sins that people practice, and it's very clear that Paul in each of those areas says that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so if you, if you feel that you can sin freely, then you're in danger of possibly not inheriting the kingdom of God, of not going there. I personally don't know how that all works. That's God's job. He knows the very hearts of people. But according to the scriptures, if a person practices that and they see no problem with it and they freely do it, then there's a possibility they don't know Jesus at all. And they're not inheriting the kingdom of God. When we closed last week, chapters 1 and 2, we found that Adam and Eve were there in the garden that God had created for them and that they were naked and they were not ashamed, we ended in chapter 2. Which, when you really contemplate that thought, not ashamed and they were naked, in other words, they were in a state of innocence. They didn't know evil. They didn't understand what evil was. They didn't have evil thoughts, they didn't have evil ways. Uh, they were in a state where everything was pretty much perfect. Perfect in every imaginable way. Uh, they were walking with God. They had the whole garden of Eden uh, to, to stroll uh, across. They had animals. They had food. They had each other, companionship. I mean, it, it's a perfect place. No arguing, no fighting, no sin, no thorns on roses, you know, no, no disasters, no hurricanes, no tornadoes. I mean, it was just a, a perfect environment. It's hard to even imagine how that environment could even exist today. And you would think that it would be worth all of that and not sin against God. But yet, we have and will be introduced to Satan, the serpent, who will come in the form of a serpent, and he will literally deceive Eve, whom um, falls for his cunning ways, craftiness, and she partakes of the fruit that she was not supposed to partake of. And so um, let's go ahead and, and get into today's uh, text. Let me break it up for you. This whole chapter, you know, there's just so much here uh, about temptation, about the literal fall itself, about how God examines us when we do fall, when we are tempted, about the enemy and how he has a great role in, in tempting us and causing us to sin, but also about the promise, the hope of the seed that would come, and that is Jesus Christ, and how one day... Christ will abolish all sin and we will once again be in paradise in heaven with him. But he does punish man, <clears throat> he punishes woman, and he punishes the serpent. He provides a covering for them in verse 21, but he also uh, ejects them from uh, paradise there because of their sin. So they lose all of that that God had built for them in that garden there. So let's go ahead and look at the temptation, verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of the tree, or you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So I highlighted some areas. Again, um, I wish we could exhaust this. We we could spend a whole night just on those five verses alone there. But uh, we're introduced to the serpent here in verse 1. The serpent who was cunning. Uh, than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. This is the introduction to Satan. Lucifer, uh, which we find in Isaiah, is his name, which means morning star in the Hebrew. He is a created being, possibly a cherub or even higher form. Uh, He has free will, just like we have free will, and he chose to fall uh, and take a third of the angels from heaven with him to earth. God cast him down. He hates God. He wants to sit in the place of God. That tells us a lot there about him. Sometimes we want to sit in the place of God. We want to rule our lives. We want to be in control. And ultimately, God is the one that is in control. Uh, And so our flesh gets in the way, and and we want to uh, lead and govern our lives. And people do it all the time, even Christians, instead of humbling themselves and surrendering themselves to God. Uh, They go ahead and they make their decisions and it ends up causing more problems than anything else. So the fall of man was affected here by this seductive serpent here, who was a real serpent, uh, a form of a serpent, and some suggest that Satan somehow entered the serpent and he was in a form of a serpent, maybe a dragon of some sort, and and he was literally talking uh, to uh, Eve here in this uh, area. Uh, John 8 gives us some um, information about him. Uh, You remember Jesus talking to the religious leaders. He He says to them, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. So the devil has certain desires and we see the religious desires were to kill Jesus, to stop Jesus. Uh, to stop Christianity from co- coming forward and so forth. So those are the same desires that Satan has um, in his children, in a sense. Uh, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. So we know in Lucifer there's no truth in him at all. He's not for truth. He won't speak truth. He's a liar, in a sense. In fact, he says uh, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and he's the father of lies. Uh, So the originator of lies comes from Satan. And when we lie, the Bible's clear that uh, we align ourselves with uh, Satan himself. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, I fear, least somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. So Paul here talks talks about the deception of the serpent deceiving Eve and then he relates that scenario that true story to us today and says we have been deceived by the craftiness of uh, Satan in our minds because we have listened to him from time to time first John 3 8 says and he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Interesting there. Uh, if you sin, you're of the devil. Now, I didn't say that. <laughs> the Bible said that. I got an interesting call the other day. I was, uh, I was on my way home from the shooting range. Uh, me and the boys in, in refuge went out and we shot some, some rounds. And we, uh, Moses wanted to go to Turner's. And as we were approaching Turner's, I was gonna, he wanted me to take the test. But I got a call, and it was from a Jewish girl. And she was very serious. She said, um, I want to speak to a pastor, and I want to speak to him right now. I have some questions. And so I told Moses, go ahead, and I'm, I'm going to take this call. And immediately she said, I'm speaking to Christians, and they're saying that God is done with Jews, that Jesus is not a Jew, and that I'm a child of the devil. 
And so is this true? Is this what you believe? You're a Christian, aren't you? And so she had all these questions and, and I just, you know, says, well, first of all, <clears throat> who's ever telling you Jesus isn't a Jew hasn't read their Bible. So that's not true. And whoever's telling you that God is done with the, the Israelites, the Jews, that is not true. They're not reading their Bible. And she goes, oh, good. Okay, so that's wrong. I thought that was wrong because because I read it in the Bible and I'm sure that it said that God wasn't done with them. And so um, I'm glad you said that. Now, am I a child of the devil? And I was like, well, <laughs> that's a tough one. I, I'm not, you know, I can't say that you're born of the devil. You know, we're all born in innocence and so forth uh, until that age of accountability. But we can kind of uh, act like the devil. We can align ourselves with the devil's plans and schemes. Uh, we can become liars and thieves and murderers and so forth. So in a sense, Jesus even said to religious leaders, you're like your father, the devil. And so in a sense, we align ourselves, not that we're literally related to him because we weren't created from him at all. So we're not, you know, connected blood wise or even in a created form, but we align ourselves with him. So, so yeah, <laughs> you know, you're, 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 well, you're saying I'm going to hell. I'm like, well, I'm not saying any of this. I'm telling you what the Bible says, and if you read your Bible, you will find that to be true too. And it was just such an interesting conversation, and I took her back to Genesis, and we talked about the Trinity and, and the word God, the very first uh, verse in Genesis chapter 1, and I said to her, it's Elohim, it's one plural and she says wow do you know hebrew i go no she goes oh well then how do you know that and i go well because i study she goes you're right it's it's l and it's plural and that's speaking of the trinity oh no 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 it's not speaking of the trinity speaking of god's mightiness his power his his omnipresence and i go he is all those but that's not what he's speaking about and so we were going back and forward and and um I mean, we're going to try to to talk some more down the road. Uh, she is definitely a, a Jewish girl, and I tried to pray with her, but she wouldn't let me pray with her as far as opening her eyes to the truth. But the scripture is there. Jesus himself calls these religious leaders, you know, uh, children of the devil. In a sense, your father is the devil. Paul said in Second Timothy fourteen, Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And that's what the scriptures teach, that it was the woman who was deceived and not Adam. Now, when you read chapters 1 and 2, and we read them last, uh, last couple of weeks, we found out that God told Adam not to eat of that tree, right? He never told Eve. It was Adam's responsibility to tell Eve. So Eve is getting secondhand information here from Adam. So she has to believe what her husband said which, which is a, a crucial part in our relationships with our wives. There's a lot about marriage here too. Um, <clears throat> you have to believe what your husband is saying. You have to trust him. Uh, you have to come alongside him and, and you need to know that he's a godly man and he's seeking God and he's going to give you godly wisdom because he's reading his Bible, he's studying, he's going to church and he's making the effort to be a godly man. I think that's a, a biblical principle. And I think that before a woman even comes to a pastor or to a church leader, they should go to their husband and say, what do you think this is saying? And then the husband should answer because that should be the head of the home. That's what scripture says. But see, this is the chapter that just tears that all apart, just totally destroys it because they had that before. And there was no problem until the serpent came to Eve and deceived the woman. <clears throat> now, my wife's sitting right there, so I'm saying this with confidence that, that she doesn't uh, disagree with me at all because she totally understands what the scriptures say. There could be, there probably was a time in our early walk with the Lord that she didn't understand that and probably would have disagreed. And in time, as you read the Bible, as you study the Bible and you get to know God, you will totally understand why he has done all of this. So <clears throat> Revelation 22 says he laid the, he laid hold of the dragon, Satan, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. So we know his place. Uh, we know Peter says he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but God is going to take him and he will cast him down into the pit forever and ever the bible says here in verse one of genesis he's cunning he is cunning and you have to know that about him he will use trickery to get you he will tempt you he will try you he will wear you down he will tell you what you want to hear he, he, he will do whatever it takes to pull you away from god and one way that that you can tell if he's involved 
in your life is if you're being pulled away from God. It's very simple. If I am pulling away from God, Satan's involved. If I am drawing closer to God, he's not in- involved. God is involved. So if you're going through a trial and it's forcing you to call on God, God's involved. But if you're going through a trial and it's forcing you to pull away from God because the trial's too big, too hard, uh, you're not focusing on God, you're, you're, you're um, focusing on yourself, how are you going to get yourself out of this, then he's involved, the devil. And so you have to understand that. Once you understand that and you realize, okay, I'm being pulled away from God, okay, he's involved, I need to now stand in God's authority against him and start drawing closer to God. I'm going to trust God now. I'm going to deny the flesh. I'm going to do whatever it takes to draw closer to God because he's cunning. <clears throat> and don't think, that <clears throat> don't think that you're more cunning than him. You're not. It is amazing how people think they know better. This is where it all started, where Eve and Adam thought, okay, I know better than God. And we still deal with it today. Every time that we are tempted with sin, we are tempted to say, I know better than God. And we end up falling. So if it wasn't Adam and Eve, and if it was Reuben and Virginia, or if it was you know uh, John and, and, and Missy, or whoever it was, they would have been in the same situation. It happened to be Adam and Eve. This serpent <clears throat> here... Again, serpent itself just represents wisdom. So he's very wise, he's very cunning, he's very wicked. Um, in Matthew ten sixteen it says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And so he's like a wolf. Therefore, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. The word cunning itself means crafty, sly, sensible, shrewd, prudent. <clears throat> he's all those things and more. And he's hoping to destroy you. And he said to the woman in verse 1, Has God indeed said? Has God indeed said? He puts a question in her mind. He puts that question there. We would probably say it this way. Are you sure that's what God said to you? Are you sure that's what God said to you? Are you certain that is what he meant? You had a perfect clear commandment from Adam what to do and the serpent comes along and says are you sure that's what he meant how many times have you been in that situation did God really mean that is God really saying it that way am I really not supposed to do that and and that question comes up the enemy's involved he plants a seed of doubt in your mind for the word of God we shouldn't doubt the word of God we should believe the word of God And he does the same with us today as he did back then. Maybe the verse doesn't really mean what I think it's saying. I don't know how many times I've I've done that in my reading through the Bible in all these years. I come across the verse and I'm like, I don't think that's what he means. Let me move on because I don't want to deal with it. And I don't know how many years I've come across the same verse and like, oh, there's that verse again. I don't want to deal with it. Let me move on. It's not what it really means or or I know what it means, but I don't want to deal with it at that moment maybe god doesn't mean that's for me maybe it's for someone else right and we look for someone else uh that it would apply to and not literally to us you know maybe 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 and that's satan's strategy is to give you the doubt to make you doubt the reliability of the scriptures of what the bibles are saying we must not believe him we need to believe god When God said, do not touch, do not eat, that's what he meant. Plain and simple and clear. And there are so many things today that he has said, do not touch, do not eat. If we were to go to Galatians chapter 5 and look at the works of the flesh, you know, um, one of them is lying. Satan's Satan's a liar. Um, Just that. Do not lie. That's pretty plain and simple. So we're not to lie. So on your taxes this year, when you go to put your mileage on there and you're tempted to put another thousand miles on there, you're tempted. Did God really mean that I can't lie on my IRS form? Is that what he meant? Yes, that's what he meant. But the government, oh, there's the enemy now rationalizing. But the government, the government is stealing from us. 
The government has a lot of my money. Taxes are too high, and so now we're justified. We'll talk about that in a minute there. So you see how he does that with us? Uh, and it's with anything, whatever sin is in your life, we must not believe him at all. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now there's the consequences, right? Now Jesus, or, or God said, when you eat of it, you shall die. Now what he meant was not literally die. And that's the doubt that he's bringing into the woman. You'll not really die. It reveals that he's a liar to her, suggesting that. Again, lying. Uh, the Bible speaks a lot about lying. Uh, Proverbs six seventeen: a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. God hates, it says. The truthful lips shall be established forever, but lying tongues is but for a moment. Proverbs uh, 12, 19. 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Just lying in itself, and that's a pretty big deal when you really think about it because we are tempted to lie quite often in our relationships, in our work, in our churches. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. How's it going? Oh, nothing's when you're, and you're just lying through your teeth. Why are you leaving? Oh, you know, all these reasons. You're lying. And yet God says don't lie. Be an honest person. <clears throat> see what the devil's saying here sin isn't a big deal don't worry about it it's not a big deal and, and a lot of christians believe that i know churches uh, i just read an article about a church who who uh now serves beer during the service and so now you can go to church and have a beer while you're hearing from the word of god you know and i hear of churches that uh Again, the Sandals Church, and they all hang around together, go out and drink and have parties together. And they all, but they all go to church and, you know, and so forth. And they're all talking about church, and you should go to church. It's good for you. But then they're all going out and partying and doing things. You know, it's amazing how a person can, can say, I'm going to church. It's a wonderful church. You should come to church. And then, and then they're over here having an affair in the background. That's sin. That's deception. That's lying. And Satan is the author of all of that. Because ultimately, lying, which God hates, and the Bible's clear that the wages of sin is death. And isn't that what happened here? Isn't that what happened with this chapter? God had everything done perfectly for them. They could have lived for eternity in that state. But they sin, and the sin brought death. And sin always brings nothing but destruction and chaos in your, to your lives, no matter what. No matter what sin it is, there's always repercussions to it. You know, <clears throat> when you're dealing with people, I, I just um, went through a little, little situation. I like to let God handle things. I've, I have been doing this long enough, and I, I have seen how people try to handle stuff. You know, I, I've dealt with marriages. This is a marriage that we're dealing with. And I see how the guys will try to handle these things and go around and do this and do that and talk theirs and talk over there and how the woman will do this. And they're all both just trying to handle things in their own strength and power. And I've just learned to just let God handle it. And just recently I went through my Facebook and a, a lot of these people that deal with, with uh, some negative things with the church, I just deleted them all. I said, I don't need to hear them. I don't need to see them. They don't need to be my friends at all. You know, they made their choices. It's time for them to move on and give them to God. Because you don't need to be involved. And that's when you start looking at them. You start hearing them. You start responding to them. You're involved in that. And all that is just destructive. It really is destructive. It's sin. It's keeping you in a state of uselessness when there's other things to be doing for the kingdom of God. I'd rather be serving God than dealing with what someone's talking about me and what they think I'm doing. I don't care. I got something to do here and I want to do it. If you want to go talk, and then go talk and draw as many people away as you possibly can. That's fine. And it's happened. Go, go. And they'll go with you. They'll follow because they have been deceived. They have been deceived. And so um, I just, you know what, I'll just let God handle it and I'll just move on and continue to do what I'm doing and not worry myself because I find myself then thinking about it, wanting to write something, you know, wanting to say something and it just, it's a waste of time. 
because it leads to destruction. Verse five, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. There, there's the thing, you'll be like God. You'll be in control. And he can't tell you what to do anymore. You'll have total free will. You know, isn't that the struggle between our relationships? You can't tell me what to do. No, but God can and God should, knowing good from evil. One of the things that I did when my boys were younger is I told them that um, the rules that we have for this home are not my rules. They're God's rules. And we're all under them. So if I'm telling you guys not to lie to me, I'm not to lie to you either. And so we're under that same rule, and it's God's rule. If, if I'm telling you not to murder each other, <laughs> there were times it got close, and I'm not to murder them either, you know? So you get what I'm saying? They're God's rules. And so when they came to me, hey, I don't like that rule. Well, don't take it up with me. Go to God, because he's the one that has given us these rules, how we should love one another, how we should respect and honor one another. You're to love your parents, you know, and honor them and so forth. So these are all God's rules, and we're all under those rules. And so you take it up with him if you have a problem with it. He's trying to break that up here. God isn't going to rule over you anymore. Because your eyes will be open. You have no need for him. You'll understand good and evil from this point on. You'll be able to make your own choices. You know? And a lot of people reject God because they don't want to surrender to his will. And they want to be able to be free enough to make their choices. And I always ask them, so how's it going? <laughs> how's your choices? How's your relationships? You know, how's things going uh, with you? you know, any struggles? And they're like, well, there's a lot of struggles. Right, because you're not submitting yourself to the Lord. And, and, and by the way, that goes for Christians too. The reason that we have wars, James tells us, and so forth, is because we're not submitting ourselves. We have our own desires, our own passions, James says. And so we're seeking to fulfill those things more than God's will, God's reign. If we were really to be in unity, we would all be seeking God and not our own desire. So God knows, and he's using this. Let's look at the fall, the literal fall here. So here, there's the temptation. Uh, there he comes, the cunningness, the, the, the craftiness, getting you, getting at you, you know, uh, using all kinds of means. Again, we're going to talk a little bit about couples here. So, you know, Virginia has no friends. She has no girlfriends that she goes out with and hangs around with. I have no boyfriends, you know, no guy friends where we go bowling and have a Friday night, you know. Uh, we don't do that. We're each other's friends, and we spend uh, most of our time with each other because there are temptations out there if she goes out with her friends and hangs out with her friends, and her friends are saying, well, he can't tell you that. You know, well, that's right. He can't tell me that. He, who does he think he is? He has no right. Well, but the Bible says he does. He's your husband. And so we keep ourselves to ourselves within this church to serve the Lord for the rest of our life. That's just the way we do it because it's safe for me, it's safe for her, and we don't run into uh, as many problems. Well, we still have our problems, but they're minimized because we're not now spreading them out there with everyone else. So he's going to come in, he's going to tempt you with your friends, the people you hang around with, the people that you're friends with on Facebook and on Instagram and all those other tweets and 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 programs and stuff that are going to try to entice you to sin why to destroy you and you got to get that to destroy you and your marriage and your family because i have seen marriages totally destroyed and people think that it's so much more in, over here they're so much better they're so much loving yeah wait till you live with them for five years you're in the same situation no no uh, that sin is destroying not just you but the church i don't know how many times marriages in this church because they've spread stuff around, have destroyed this church. Oh yeah, their marriage is dissolved and it's been done with, but it affected the church and people have left because of it, because they choose sides. And I tell you, I, I have a, a, a phrase that I, I kind of made up. In our relationships, in marriages, uh, when, there are no choosing sides. There are no choosing sides because nobody's a winner that way. When you choose a side, you become a loser. Don't even be involved in it. Someone comes up to me in their marriage, I'm here to help you, but don't tell me about it. That's it. 
you and them need to go and take care of that. You need to follow God's word and, and take care of your, your business. But don't be telling me your business. Don't be sharing it with other people, trying to gain a buddy over here and a friend over here so that all of a sudden you now have people on your side. There are no winners when you choose sides. They're both losers. I've seen it over and over again. You just lose. And it affects the church. People leave. And that's just with the temptation. Look at the fall, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. So we see here that, that he enticed her enough that all of a sudden her perspective and her wisdom became flawed. She began to see things that weren't really there. And, and we do that. Like the children of Israel, when they were being led by Moses to the promised land. At least back in Egypt, we had cucumbers. We had all kinds of herbs. We had be- They never had any of that. It was all the Egyptians who had it. They were slaves. They were in bondage, but they had a obscure view of their situation at that moment just like she does here because she all of a sudden says oh it's good food oh it seems to be pleasant you know oh he's he's so pleasant he's so he's not like my husband he seems to be nicer yeah because he wants to sleep with you that's why and once he does that then you're discarded you're destroyed and now you're hurt And he goes off a victor, as he feels like one of of some sort. But we do that. Well, she's so much prettier. She's so much younger, you know. And again, it just destroys the family and the kids. You know, it it cracks me up how how we live in such a society that has has accepted this, that now we all become buddies and friends. You know, oh yeah, they're divorced three times, you know. But we're all buddies and friends now. That, That just blows me away. We've accepted it instead of standing firm and saying, you know what, there's, there's a right and a wrong. And, and we need to stand up for what's right. <clears throat> and so her eyes deceived her, her desires, the hunger and so forth, which can be very strong. And so she ate of it. <clears throat> and then she gave it to her husband. <clears throat> uh, his mistake was to love her more than God. And so he ate of it because he loved her and wanted to appease her and keep her happy. That's a hard place to be because you want to treat your wife as a weaker vessel. The Bible says to do that. You want to wash her with the word of God or at least live that word in front of her. You want to love her as Christ loved the church, but you also at the same time want to stand on the truth and you want to make that known to them in a loving and caring way as possible. And one of the best ways is just love them. Just love them and be very clear that I think that what you're doing is destructive and it's going to head down the wrong path. But I love you and I'm here for you and I will continue to just pour God's love on you. And there's a way of doing it and you're going to struggle. You're going to uh, fall, you know, and not always do it the right way. But you get back up and you do it again. We need to move on. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves covering and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Several things here. We see that all of a sudden they realize you're naked. I'm naked. Shame came in. They realize evil. Before they didn't have evil, now they know evil, they are experiencing evil. And what do they do? They cover themselves. That's righteous, that's their self-righteousness. I need to do something about this nakedness, this shame that I feel because they hid and ran from God and they hid themselves and covered themselves. Uh, That's shame. And that's what sin does. When we fall into sin, we feel shameful. Uh, When you sin, sometimes you feel dirty. And you want to take a shower and scrub. And sometimes the harder you scrub, it seems like it hasn't come off. And that's the self-righteousness of an individual. They were being self-righteous here. They thought their coverings, their little fig leaves would take care of everything and God wouldn't notice anything. And, and many religions are that way. You know, do a sacrament. Uh, give a little money. Uh, do a little bit of work. 
Uh, there was a word that they used to use, penance. We don't use that word penance because penance meant that you had to hurt yourself to show that you're very, very sorry and remorseful and so forth. So you're actually hurting yourself to show God that he should forgive you. Uh, we use repentance. In other words, turning from it and believing that God has forgiven us through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. I like that much better because it's not my work. And God does show that here. So they hide themselves from the Lord um, and so he comes into the situation and he, he, what, he begins to examine them. Look at verse 9 through 13. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Just a, just a simple question. Where are you, Adam? And God is always a gentleman. He's always kind. He doesn't, he doesn't accuse us. He loves us. He cares about us. He cares, he cares about our situation. He definitely cares about the repercussions of our choices and he wants to set us right. And so he just asked us, what, what, what are you doing? Oh, I know, I love. <laughs> Lord, oh boy, there you are. He's always with you. He's always watching. What are you doing? Adam, where are you? So he said, well, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Why? Before he wasn't afraid. Now he understands fear. Before it was, let's go walking, God. Hey, God, what's going on? Hey, let's have some time together. Let's go have a picnic, you know. Let's go play with the animals, you know. Hey, you got some wisdom for me today, God? And now it's like, I fear God. Fear. That's why fear is not of God. Uh, Timothy tells us that, that we're not to be fearful. <clears throat> we're not to stress out. <clears throat> we're not to be anxious for anything. That's all from the fall of Adam and Eve here. He feared. I feared you. I was afraid of you because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat of? Now, how many things has God commanded us? First John tells us that if you love me, follow my commandments. Did Adam and Eve love God? Not at this moment. They loved him less. They loved themselves more. They believed the lie. And they wanted to fulfill their passion and their flesh. Who told you that? <clears throat> Somebody told you. Somebody enticed you. And of course that was the serpent. Verse 12, then the man said, the woman, the woman, then the man said, the woman whom you gave to me, with, with me, she gave me the, of the tree and I ate. So first thing Adam does is justifying it. In other words, he didn't say, I ate of it and I'm guilty and you caught me and now I fear you and I'm naked and I'm ashamed. In other words, that's true repentance and self-examination. That's how it should have went, but he didn't say that. He said, it's your fault, God. That's what he said. It's your fault. You gave me the woman and she gave it to me and I fell for it. You're to blame. How many times do we blame God for things? I was coming down on Limonite one day. Car tried to swerve in front of us right there, right at the golf course. Major accident, cars spinning around and so forth. And this lady comes out and she's screaming and yelling on the car. I mean, she's cursing God. I mean, she's literally with her hands in the air. Blankety blank, you God. You know, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of life. I'm tired of things happening. And she's just cursing God. And so I get out of my company car and I run over there to make sure everyone's okay. And I'm trying to calm her down because she's just emotionally stressed over the whole situation. I said, I said, God isn't at fault here. He just saved your life. He just protected you. You could be dead. She said, oh, I didn't think of it that way. And then all of a sudden, oh, God, you know, and she went back at it again. You did this, God. You're doing this, God. How many times do we blame God? How many times do we blame God? We were talking about people during Christmas time and the struggles that they have. They lose someone during Christmas, and they blame God for it. God isn't at fault. We need to realize God is good. Who's at fault? The fall. Sin. Man. Our choice is to reject God and not surrender ourselves to Him. That's why we have the pain and the suffering in this world. We don't submit ourselves to Him. And we need to submit ourselves to Him. But we don't want to, so we'll blame. It's your fault, God. It's the woman's fault. 
you gave her to me. And so I ate of the tree. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? (laughs) Pretty clear, right? Turns to her. So what have you done here? And then the woman said, it's the serpent. He deceived me and I ate. And she should have said, you're right. I didn't listen to my husband. He told me not to eat of it. He told me you told him that, right? You told him that, you know, I should have believed him, but I didn't. And I believed this liar, this serpent, and I ate of the fruit. And I am so sorry because now I know evil. I I feel shameful and I'm before you and, and I need your help. But she did it. She blamed the serpent. He deceived me. It was him. And that's why I ate of it. You know, we can't blame people and we do it all the time. Well, I don't like my husband because. I don't like my wife because. I don't like my situation because. And the reason that I'm acting out is because of this. You know, kids who cut themselves. I'm cutting myself because nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. You know, nobody really understands me. And they're blaming other things instead of saying, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. This is not what God wants me to do. He has a plan for me. He loves me. He cares about me. But we blame and we feel justified. They hurt me. They didn't love me. I had a boyfriend and he didn't love me the way that he should have loved me. And so that's why I hurt myself. You know what? It's not your boyfriend's fault. You need to understand that you need to surrender your life to Christ and let him have your life. And he will lead you in a good way. So what, what does God do? He has no choice. I mean, because again, the wages of sin is death. There's repercussions for what you do. We know that today. If you run across the stop sign, you're going to get a ticket if they catch you. Or a light, you're going to get a ticket. And if you destroy your family, there's going to reper- re- be repercussions in your family. So the Lord has to curse them. So, verse 14, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any cattle. And more than any, every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And so we see the serpent there being cursed by God. So the serpent now, the snake is a reminder to us that God has fall through his curse upon the serpent. And so they're on their belly and they're always eating dust to this day. And then he gives us a promise in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now here is the first prophetic word of Jesus Christ. This is the hope. And Jesus is, and God is talking to Adam and Eve and said, look, because of your sin, because of what you've done, and because I have to bring a curse, there will be enmity between you and the serpent from now on. He will always be harassing you. He will always be fighting against you. And he's doing that today against us always. But I'm going to take his seed and I'm going to take your seed. And that seed there, it's funny, as I was talking to the Jewish girl, she brought this up because I I mentioned this being a prophetic word of Jesus. She says, no, because that word seed is in the plural. I said, thank you. Yes, it's in the plural. It's speaking of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus is the, is the second person of the Trinity and is speaking of Jesus in the future. He's the Messiah and he shall, he shall bruise his head. The serpent will try to bite his heel, bite him to destroy him on the cross. Satan thought he had him on the cross. That's it, I'm killing him. They got him on the cross, he's gonna die. And when Jesus resurrected, he crushed the serpent's head, which, which that is where most of the venom is at, most of his power. So he crushed him completely in his head. And so this speaking of the Messiah that will come, Jesus Christ, our hope. And so he's given him encouragement here. Though there will be enmity, it will be struggle, it will be battle for all of humanity, yet Jesus will come. Look at the punishment on man and and woman here. To the woman, he said, verse 16, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. So there's where sorrow and conception came in to the woman. Uh, Before you you used to give birth, there there was no pain there. You would just and have children without any problem. You wouldn't be screaming, you'd be yelling, you wouldn't be screaming at your husband, squeezing his hand. I remember Virginia, oh, this hurts. 
this is your fault, you know. Uh, it, there wasn't any of that. But because of the curse, God says, woman, so now when you conceive, you're going to have pain. You're going to have sorrow. Your sons will die. They will die. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. What does that mean? Boy, there's a good study there. Uh, the last time I taught about it, um, Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Sin wants to rule over you. Women want to rule over their husband. That's the part of the curse. Uh, women wanting to rule their husband. That's part of the curse. It's not God's plan. Uh, women need to be submissive to their husband. Uh, come alongside and help their husband. Um, I, I can say that I am so proud of my wife because she comes alongside of me and she helps me. She doesn't fight me. She submits herself to me and she pleases me. And it's such a joy to see that in our lives. And I so much want to love her more than I love her now, which is a lot, I think, but maybe not enough. And it's just so nice to see that she understands that she is not to rule over me. That is her desire from time to time and she has to hold it back and let God in her life. But interesting study there. Look that up and, and take some time there, ladies, to find truth. Uh, you'll find that your marriages will go so much smoother. You young ladies, you will find that if you understand this, that when you choose a man, you choose the right man, a godly man, a man that loves you, you won't have to rule over him because he will give you everything that you desire because you are that woman that is coming alongside him to help him. Then he said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife, okay? Because you listen to your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So that's why men work is hard. That's why you sweat. That's why you get tired. Uh, because you listen to your wife. You know, this is interesting here because I, 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 I've run across this quite often where, where women are, are asking their husbands, you know, for, for them to provide more. But then at the same time, they're also asking their husbands to stay home more. And, and that's a hard thing to do, isn't it? How do you work more but stay home more? Because what they're saying is, I want more, but I want you home more. And so you have to choose one or the other. You can't have both. See, I don't like him anymore because he's always working. And he's never home. Okay, so what do you want him to do? Work or stay home? Because he works. It's hard work. He comes home. He's tired. And he's not going to be able to spend the time that you probably want him to spend because of the curse again. And so that's why we get tired. That's why we go at new projects gung-ho. And then as we're into them, we lose interest, and we, it just kind of falls by the wayside. Oh, I'll, I'll take care of that next time. I mean, how many times do we do that? Or it's always at the end, finishing the project. That's why they call it the finish work, because that's always the hardest thing to do. Or the cleanup. We hate that, the cleanup. That used to be a joy before the fall. Now it's a curse to us because he, he uh, obeyed his wife's voice. So the cursed is the ground for your sake, he said. Now both thorns, thistles, it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. In other words, till you die. So did, did, um, did this sin bring death? Yes, it did, didn't it? They died. You're going to work hard the rest of your life until you die. And I can just see Eve, but he said we wouldn't die. He told us we wouldn't die, that we'd be like you, that you were lying. Well, he lied to you because he's the father of lies. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living things. So she was the first woman. Adam is, means red because he's of the earth. Um, <clears throat> and they will die. Then we see their first covering here. Now here's where God provides. They're, they're hiding, they're ashamed, they're making their fig leaves. That's, that's self-righteousness, that's religion. 
We can't save ourselves and go to heaven. Not everyone is going to heaven. That's a hard one. Uh, when I was talking to that Jewish girl, she says, you're telling me I'm not going to heaven? Like, again, I'm not telling you anything. The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one can get to the Father except through me. If you don't go through Jesus, then you can't get to the Father. She, and I said, you have to have the Messiah. She goes, what the word Messiah means, anointed one. Thank you. Jesus the Christ. Do you know what Christ means? It means anointed one in the Greek. She goes, oh, I thought that was his last name. I go, no. <laughs> the Jews understood that he was the Messiah, so they call him anointed one. Jesus was Jewish. He knew exactly who he was. Well, I can't believe I'm not going to heaven. You're saying I'm not going to I'm not saying you aren't going to heaven. God is saying that if you don't have Jesus and surrender your life to him, you're not going to heaven. If you want to go to heaven, you need to surrender your life to Jesus. But I totally understand that there's a veil on your eyes because the Bible talks about that for the Jews because they rejected Jesus in the beginning. She's going by works. As long as she, she, she has enough good works, they will outweigh her bad works. That is not how it works. As long as I have a few coverings or more coverings or more coverings, maybe God won't notice that I'm naked. You know, it doesn't work. He notices you're naked. He notices you sin. And I just wanted more time with her. I wanted to say, well, let me ask you a question. Do you ever lie? And she would have had to say, yeah. So what does that make you? A liar. You're a liar. How many here are liars? If you're honest enough, how many of you are lie? Okay, not all of you lie. That's good. I'm glad some of you don't lie. You're lying. <laughs> Tell me that. Of course, it's, it's the man you gave me. He makes me lie. <laughs> you're right. You're liars. You've broken one of God's commandments. How many have stolen something? You ever steal something? Then you're a thief. You're a lying thief, the Bible says. So why should God let you go into heaven when you're a lying thief? Because he's good. Well, if you steal from Walmart and you lie to the judge that you didn't steal and they show it on the camera that you stole, you think that judge is going to let you go? No, he's going to fine you. But wait a minute, you could say, but he's a loving judge. Yeah, and that's why he's going to fine you because he wants to make sure that Walmart gets their money because they spend money on making things and they employ people. And that's the right thing to do. You're a lying thief and you need to be punished. Same is true with God. When we break his commandments, when we don't follow his rules, then we have to be judged unless we come to Jesus and through Jesus. And we get his covering. Look at verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, not for the serpent, but for Adam and his wife, God made a tunic of skin and clothed them. The first sacrifice, a lamb, which is a type of Jesus' atonement on the cross. God made the covering. God covered them with skin. God will send his only begotten son to die on the cross for them. But... Even though they have the covering, they still have to suffer the consequences. And so he ejects them from the garden. Verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, at least he put out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the reason that God ejects them, again, is not just to be mean, but to also protect them. At least they live in that sinful state for eternity. Boy, wouldn't that be sad to live this way? Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go home. Uh, I'm tired of my body. I'm tired of sinning. You know, this whole deal going to uh, Sudan. I, Virginia's like, I'm a little scared. I don't know what happened. Hey, what, what a way to go. Yeah, but what if they capture you and torture you? I'm not worried about that. <clears throat> you will be when you're being tortured. I go, you'll be taken care of. She goes, I know that, but I don't want you to get hurt. And that's her love for me. And I'm like, I know, but this is an opportunity where I can go in glory. Wouldn't that be great? And finally be in heaven. And this flesh, this body, uh, you know, and all the pain and suffering that comes with it and whatever pain and suffering I caused other and the guilt from that and even where I don't realize that I've caused it on others but they tell me that I've caused it I apologize I'm sorry for doing that for being that person that personality the being that I am how I was created man all that I hate I hate it <clears throat> 
And I want to get rid of it. And the only way to get rid of that is go home in this body. <clears throat> it's the only way. But I'm here, and i got to wait until that happens. And so I suffer the consequences of sin in my life. <clears throat> he knows now good and evil, but we don't want him to live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubs at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So he put angels in front of the garden there to guard the way so that nobody could um, come back in with a flaming. I mean, this is protection. And cherub, cherubs are as plural. There's two. Because you can almost imagine uh, Lucifer was kicked out too. He, he would probably want to come back in, grab some fruit, and then say, hey, Adam and Eve, hey, guess what? I got plan two or B. Let's try this. You, know, you want to live forever? Because he's lying. You're not going to die. Eat this and you'll live forever. So God put two cherubs there so that he could not get in and entice them again. So God loves us. He's provided for us a, a way. And, and it's just such a simple way that it's so profound for people to even understand or grasp. It has nothing to do with what we do. It's what Jesus has done for us. And yet we fight it because we rather fulfill the lust of our own flesh and desires in this world. But it only destroys us. It kills us. What we need to do is fight sin, and we need to fight it hard. This is what Billy Sunday said. I'm against sin. I'll kick it as long as, as, long as I've got a foot. I'll fight it as long as I've got a fist. I'll butt it as long as I've got a head. I'll bite it as long as I've got teeth. And when I'm old and fistless and footless and toothless i'll gum it until i go home to glory <laughs> and it goes to perdition <laughs> it says fight it fight it fight it don't give in to it because it will guys it will destroy you it will destroy your families it will destroy your kids if you're thinking of divorce don't do it work it out be miserable for 80 years don't put your kids through that stuff don't be so selfish and self-centered. Work it out in your relationships. If you're looking for a man or for a woman, then you wait for the right man, for the right woman. Don't put yourself in a situation that's going to cause pain. You make sure that not only you found the man, but that your parents see the man and your pastor sees the man and you have people that will verify that that's the man or the woman for you. Don't just depend on how you feel. Make sure they have the qualities and the character and the integrity before you make those decisions because you're going to head into a lot of trouble if you don't. <clears throat>